And we're live on the stream. Deedle deedle, deedle deedle, ah. doodle dee dee, do 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 do. You know, I thought Benadryl was a perfectly fine gift for Halloween candy, but you know, what can I do? It's not my fault. I've been slowly buying at Costco. Each time I do my Costco run, I'm picking up a big, big ass bag of candy. And I had my first. I thought you're going to say baby oil. <laughs> oh, geez, Louise. No. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, I had my first uh, uh, desire to, to just maybe go and take one little bar from the bag of candy. Just, just one. Oh. The kids won't. They won't miss one little bar from the oh, no. two pound bag of candy, will they? But I was, I was strong. God was with me, steeled my reserve. I kept my wandering hand and uh, uh, went back to sleep, which was good. Oh, okay. I won't survive as soon as it turns. I mean, like, I'm not going to make it all of October without digging into that gigantic bag of candy. Yeah. I, when I get like stressed, um about you know when i get stressed out about like uh working on a book or whatever you know mm -hmm. i'll buy candy and then it's fine but then when the candy's gone what do i do you know like yeah. i mean i, I have to buy more stuff. candy that's what i'd say just go ahead keep the candy train rolling all right you gents ready to weird it up Yup. All right, here we go. Three, two. Oh, did I need to say one? Sorry. <laughs> I thought you meant we're doing. Are we live on the live? We because we oh, go live. Oh, we're oh, live. Oh, oh. I thought, we're live now. Yeah. Are we okay. Okay. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> the Benadryl thing was a joke, everybody. Oh no! Don't <laughs> right, do that. Here, I'll start. I'll start it up. All right, ready? Three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Justin Robert Young. What up? Gentlemen, how are you doing this week? Uh, good. Now that true fall has arrived in Texas. Not the false face. Oh, yeah. true fall. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I mean, we're still getting up to the mid nineties. We're 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 half the day is fall, and then summer uh, peaks in a little bit uh, uh, in the middle. Yeah, all oh, this weather—it's it's perfect walking weather here. You know, it'd be really cool to go What's walking that? with. I would love to go walk with augmented reality, but my Apple Vision Pro kind of giant. If only there was like a cooler smaller version of ar coming out well uh, in addition to the uh the snapchat one that we talked about uh well imagine if a company that was really serious about technology <laughs> and vr we actually had vr products out there built something uh, go on uh, I, I i would subscribe like to this maybe, newsletter maybe did a you, little did, uh, a little meta yeah, so uh, one of the things you learn about tech announcements is sometimes people show things off because they know somebody else is going to show something off. And so, you know, we saw Snapchat show a thing off, and we're like, well, that's that's cute that you're doing that, I are guess. You, are you guys sure that's what you wanted to be showing off? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, little 40 view POV kind of thing, and it just didn't seem. And then, and then the Zuck came on stage at their big Facebook event, and then he showed Project Orion. Have you seen this, Brian? No, I Does have Does he still not. look like he was possessed by a Dominican barber? Or has he changed his look since then? Uh, I think he's probably dropping his second mixtape now. Um, <laughs> and it's actually got some pretty good. It's matured since the you know the college years. And I think it's exactly. got some really good, yeah. Uh, he, he, so, he, he looks like he owns the label for the reggaeton artist. Yeah. So I would I would take a look at look at look at yeah, Project here, Orion and we can all see. Yeah, here this, we go. Uh, uh, so they got to, uh, they got some animated gifs here that show what I assume is a superior uh, frame uh, field of view to the Snapchat. Yeah. One. So the Snapchat one is like forty degrees. This is like seventy degrees, and it's also seen to get a lot more powerful. Like this is showing us video playing and other capabilities yeah. there uh they no release date yet 
and he said, "Hey, we want to show you this is real, not a thing we're just talking about." And they proceeded to just talk <laughs> about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but they they're doing a very interesting thing. So they're they're doing you know uh, it's not like pass through like you know the Oculus does or the Apple Vision does. It is using waveguide, so which is basically projected onto a lens in front of your eye. And what's kind of curious about this is that they're calling those things holograms because they realize the problem is is that when you do that kind of projection, if there's something bright in back of you or in front of you, it'll show through. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, well, and I guess, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, what's a hologram outside of a thing that is a 3D thing or floating? Yeah. And so for demos, they went and they had people playing games and playing other kinds of stuff. So the... The reaction to the approved people on video were least to talk about it has been very positive. There's some YouTube yeah. videos up there, people using it, and a much, much more enthusiastic response than Apple Vision Pro got. Huh. So so uh, I'm guessing <clears throat> Apple Vision Pro looked uh, read a bit like a very excellent canvas waiting for somebody to paint on it, whereas this... At least people can get a tangible idea of what they'll use it for from day one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Apple wanted to have, Apple decided, hey, we need to have a couple things. Like the, technically, they said, we need to have perfect reality, whatever things in front of you have to look as close to real as possible, which meant that the processor requirements are certain point. Two, they had to do pass through then because of the problem. You can't just project onto a lens because if there's something bright in back of you, you know, you can't, you can't project black, right? Uh, so that's why they did pass through. Then they wanted to have the occlusion. So you could hold your hand in front of a thing and it would look like it was in back of your hand, which is a very, very kind of important detail, um, which is computationally is very intensive because you're basically every frame you're using an AI to sort of map out where your hand is and to sort of figure out, you know, uh, how to cut. Th th this is like in film, uh, pre previous to, uh, you know, I guess really Lucasfilm. Uh, uh, whenever they would do a space background and a model shot, they would use first the plate of the stars and then the 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 model going over it. But that meant that if you look at lower budget sci-fi stuff from the late seventies, you would see the stars through it. Uh, whereas Lucasfilm would use a they would have a mat to separate the two. So essentially, it would be like an AI carve out of your hand to not project on that area. Yeah, yeah, you used or the mat. You would be the mat originally to keep part of the film unexposed. So basically, you'd use the mat to unexpose, then you'd re-expose it with your model or whatever. But yeah, the same. It's like blue screen. You know, you blue screen. You need a blue thing in back of you to create the separation. So what the Apple Vision does, and you can see this in your iPhone too. Your iPhone can do this, where it will look at your. It, it predicts this is a hand, and it will cut that out, and so it'll look like the, your hand is over the image. Um, but it's computationally hard. The other thing that Apple wanted to do was, you know, recreate your eyes in front of the thing. And they created this kind of uncanny effect that I don't think really justified the expense and how much effort they went through. And I think in Facebook is kind of like, well, if you really see if is it bad that it's just like, you know, is, is it bad that you see a uh, and I'll give you a thing that's kind of cool about the Facebook approach is Facebook's like, is it bad if these things are sort of like a little bit translucent? in front of you you know and another thing they can do too is i've got um i've got my glass my i've got these uh, uh glasses that i use and they're these are great these are like 300 bucks one of the best tech investments i've ever made which is uh if i want to watch movies and stuff when i travel and so that's got the 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 lenses there i can you know i can see you guys here i can project a movie whatever but you know how i use these I put this on there and just ah, block yeah. out everything in front yeah. of there. So, so you it's, want to give the social clue uh, clue to everybody that, uh, hey, uh, whatever it is you're doing, I'm not paying well, attention think, uh, to you, it. He, he's, he's using it on like airplanes and stuff. Like yeah, that, airplanes right? I go right, to sleep yeah. at night, like if I'm in a hotel room, whatever. So, But my point is, is like you, you can take a augmented reality glass that does the projection like they're doing and just black out or put black it out. like LCD shutters and then you've got a 3D headset on it. So... I think the approach that Facebook tried here is actually really kind of smart because the idea is that, you know, hey, if I don't, you know, if you don't need to see what's in front of you or we can use the cameras to do it, we could create a wave guided system. And they didn't talk about this, but I think that will be a capability of what will be. We can just black it out and boom, it's an Oculus. Well, here's the biggest question that I think will affect the success of this product. What's the battery life and what's the weight? 
Uh, he says under uh, 100 kilograms is the threshold that they want to keep. They want to keep this thing that light on your head. There's the did, glasses wait, did, with the did battery you say in there. Hundred kilograms. Hundred hundred grams. Oh, okay. Gram. Hundred kilograms. <laughs> it's a very you know ambitious. That would be head, amazing. Head, head, head. <laughs> yeah. 100 grams. Sorry, U.S. citizen here. Um, we went to the we went to the moon. Um, so uh, it's a hundred like 100 grams is what he says the ideal weight is. And so, you know, they're doing. Uh, listen, Zuckerberg does a lot of things when he puts his attention on something like A.I. Incredible amount of it's been it's done. been very impressive, very impressive yeah. what he's done with A.I. in in, in the limited space. If you, if you look at all the players that have the kind of infinite money to do stuff. I would say outside of OpenAI and Anthropic, which are more native and focusing all of their attention on it, I would say Facebook has and Meta has has done some of the most impressive stuff, and that and yep. that is that is really saying something because Google should have that whole position. Well, an advantage that an advantage that is that Facebook has over Apple is Facebook has a guy with a very intelligent guy who will go in there and say, yes, no, yes, no, you're wrong. And sometimes be wrong. Where Tim Cook kind of like uh, Apple Vision Pro feels like it's a committee came together and came to agreement. And it's the United Nations of a headset, which, yeah. you know, some of the things are great. Some of the things are not. And the way it comes together is just not ideal. And it's, it's, I can't even imagine what, like mine has not been used in months. I can't even imagine what the numbers are like for usage on those things. So, this is I don't know exactly what the heartbeat of that company is now. I do know that when I was spending a lot of time when I was in the Bay Area, Facebook, even at its most bloated, always had more of an ingrained uh, a hacker culture within it that they they would let things kind of bubble up to the top by way of, uh, uh, hey, somebody try to do something cool and we're going to put some time and effort behind it. And there was no hesitation from facebook to try to pivot toward uh wherever the heat is on on things and that's in tremendous uh difference especially to google where the fiefdoms are entirely controlled by middle management and everybody is just trying to invent metrics that they can hit and move on to the next quarter yeah so I I'm I'm more excited about this. I mean, not not no disrespect to Snapchat, which I'm glad they're experimenting in that space. But I think that when it comes to who's really going to be coming out with the heart, I'm not excited about it being stuck on the, you know <laughs> the Facebook platform. Yeah, but as a hardware point of view, which by the know, way, very, very... Uh, I know in theory should be such a trivial detail, but but I found myself like just weirdly uncomfortable. I, I had to swallow that pill during the pandemic to enjoy all the time that we spent together, you know, with the, with the quest, with the, with the Oculus. Uh, yeah. It was a quest, right? Yeah. Quest. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't know why that, that seems to upset me so much. It's just residual. I, I guess it's residual trauma of them bringing me on their platform and screwing me over many times. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, me. that's just come down to it is that, that, that it's been a, a, it's a frustrating experience where, yeah, we've, we've creators and whatnot have had that experience and we know what they say now is not going to be true tomorrow. And the reliability of what they do is just not there. They build some great things and they've got some great people working for them. And, you know, Zuckerberg, I was telling somebody today, you know, a journalist about that. When you talk about amazing stories, uh, you think about Zuckerberg when he was going to have the majority of the shares and he was going to be the one running Facebook. Everybody's like, are you kidding? This kid has no experience. He's straight out of college. And everybody was sort of not everybody. People were just sort of betting against him. Yeah. And Facebook is a trillion dollar company. It is a rival to Google ran by Zuckerberg. And yes, he had capable executives there. But at the end of the day, he got to call all those shots. Yeah. And that's insane. And I think he's had a very interesting, like, last three years. He seems to have uh, uh, come of age and now feels very comfortable in his own skin. Uh, and we'll see where he goes with the AI stuff. But I think, you know, again, what they have done in terms of saying, like, we're going to put time, effort, and resources into these open source models and then, you know, hopefully have them at a prime position so they can build them into their products and they can just make their products run and sing on a level that they wouldn't otherwise – it's it's really smart. It's really good, and the stuff that they've done has been remarkable. Uh, of any of the, it's so funny to call Facebook a legacy player, but it is a legacy player at least when it comes to AI. 
you know, and another thing they did, and uh, you know, uh, the Meta Quest 3S. So they've now made a a basically it's a supposed to be a cheaper version of the bigger Quest, but it actually has like better better battery life. And I don't really know, but anyhow, they brought back a three hundred dollar entry level Quest mm. comes with Batman Arkham Shadow, the Batman VR game. Uh, a three hundred dollar quest, you know, and like I said, I, I <laughs> yeah, Andrew's gonna go on about this for a while, guys. I've got a thirty five hundred dollar <laughs> plus Oculus, I mean, you know, <laughs> did, Apple did, Vision did, Pro. Did you end up buying two of those me. like you were talking about? What's no, that? this is there. There was a brief moment before they came out that you were talking about buying two of them. Yeah, and then the price came out. The, the price they announced oh, the got price. It, got it. I'm okay, like, all yeah, right. yeah. When they announced the price, I'm like, no, I'll get. I'll get one, and I yeah. could have returned it, but I'm like, I'm gonna keep it as my my museum of. You no, know. you get too much mileage out of complaining yeah. about the fact that you don't use it. Like that's that's worth its it, its own its own weight in gold. I, it is it is your example to Apple. Uh yeah, it's it, it has helped me reflect a lot on. So I'm gonna give you an example here. So you think about this. You're thinking about buying a uh, Apple Vision Pro, which nobody is right now. Let's be honest. You could <laughs> yeah. buy an Apple Vision Pro. Uh, Andrew, can I can I tell you just how right you are? Yesterday morning, I was driving uh, back from Justin's, and I realized it was less than two miles out of my way, round full trip to stop by the mall and see if there happened to be any iPhones in stock. And I was physically just a few feet away, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll find out just how good that looks. And then I thought. Or I could just go. <laughs> so then I just left. So I still don't know how good the display looks. So you could you could buy an Apple Vision Pro, thirty six hundred bucks, whatever, or buy twelve MetaQuest three S's. Buy a fleet. Have them around your house, and everybody can play. <laughs> you know, everybody gets to play. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, we we can we've, we've done many versions of this show, but just so everybody gets all the beats, uh, good gravy For, to come out with something at that price point and not have it be a daily driver is insane. That is that is a a tremendously underwhelming, uh, uh, a. a you know, I, I was. I mean, I don't know. Who who knows what a disaster is when you have that much money in the bank? You know, for for Apple, when you have like several countries worth of cash, and you can like start up a car company and then spike it because you don't like it. Like if if you're playing with that those kinds of uh uh that that kind of yeah. bank account, but but still, it was it was you know for what I think they wanted to be a defining new generation product for them. It has stunk up the joint. Yeah, I think that they they've built an OS. Where they go, what they try next, we'll see. Like I said, the 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 problems I have with it is just uh, they didn't have any. There, what what do I go use my vision for? Like literally, what is the app I go do that for? What is the you know? I know where my iPhone goes, everywhere my computer doesn't. So I know I browse to do this. You know, my my iPad is a lot of a lot of the reading on the web. You just want to sit there and read. I'd rather rather read. There's stuff I just rather do my iPad. Apple didn't create any any special useful apps for it. Like no yeah. creative spaces. No, like remember Tilt Brush? That was the thing that yeah. sold me. Uh, sold us. I think you know, sold you guys on the Valve. Oh, and absolutely then sold me. on the Vive. Yeah. Yeah, vibe. Yeah, and then you think about like if Apple had built their version of that of like create these really cool 3D spaces with your paintbrush and whatever, and share them, and put in gifts and things like this, and go. I would, I think people would be whether it be have long term utility. I don't know, but like if people get excited by a Notion template, I think people could get really excited by an Apple Vision workspace or some creative environment. But they just, you know. Well, and, and I think I think you touched upon like the neat thing about Tilt Brush is that that was a category of thing that there was literally no other way to do. Um, and I think the example that I heard about is like people were prototyping cars using Tilt Brush because they could physically map out the space and and instead of carving them out of you know Adobe Clay or whatever, they they were able to do it virtually. So. At that point, it's like you have a killer app that can't be done any other way, or you can win by doing something that you have to do anyway, but removing the friction and making it so easy, you know, like the iPhone did, where it's like 
yeah, you know, the the UI is so intuitive and simple, and the pinch and zoom was a game changer and so on. Uh, but but to have that level of expertise and then like. You know, what do you do with it? I don't know. Seems like you guys could figure something out, maybe. Yeah, you know, I, I remember during the demo, there was a, a thing that was really exciting to me of you could plug it into a, like a YouTube TV or something and then just have a gigantic multi-view where you'd be like in the middle of a room. You could turn any room into like a, a Vegas sports book with a bunch of different uh, things. And there were like all these interesting ways that you could watch a a football game and, and maybe you could look down and visualize some of the data that was like coming in or, you know, th and we never really saw any of it. I think that was all just like demo stuff that I guess may have happened if there was an install base for it. And then there just wasn't. And so, you know, even as a consumption device, if you were just going to look at it, like a $3,000 television that you can bring anywhere, which is still way high, $3,500, $3,500. Sorry. I, I didn't, uh, didn't realize, but it's, it's gotta be best in class and you have to be getting exclusive nowhere else kind of experiences. And aside from it being apparently a very capable, uh, uh, you know, viewing experience, it's too gosh dang heavy. You don't, yeah. you don't want to watch a full football game. You don't want to watch a full, uh, uh, movie with it. Uh, so, uh, yep. uh, just to loop it back on the Orion, uh, did they did they spell out any must have use cases for it as it exists, not as how it might end up? I would say watch the presentation. I think that what they're trying to pitch it as is is that so like I have I added another mo I have a widescreen monitor here. And I added another one here that literally for Notion, just so I can see my task list and all that. And so like my, 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 the number, you know, Andrew's, you know, Andrew says there's a Moore's law to screen space, which you can literally predict the amount of screen space that we put in front of us keeps doubling at a certain rate. Yeah. And, and we know that's going to happen. So yeah, they show it as a fun thing to play casual games. You can play games. They show them playing ping pong with it, which has seemed very responsive video stuff, whatever. I think that I do think there is a space for an AR type thing, much like the iPad it was hard for us to go. Why do we need an iPad? It's just a bigger iPhone. And then you get an mm -hmm. iPad and you go, oh, yeah, there's a lot of these other kinds of things. And there's a lot of like a lot of computing. Your computing stays here or it goes with you to your phone when you pick it up in somewhere else. But if you have a glass, that's a really good computer. You compute here and you get up and you go somewhere else and the compute follows you. Um, I think that using your space, like, I mean, like, I do think it would be fun to put on a pair of glasses and have one of you jokers virtually sitting across me just as we work. Oh yeah. yeah. Like uh, kind of a virtual office that it's like when somebody has something, it just be bops up. And then no matter what you're doing, if, if it's an interruptible menial task or whatever, you could be like, what do you got? And then you could continue about your drive oh, yeah. or what I, have you. I, you know, a, a story that I think that needs to be covered more often is, I went to I went to a friend's house and they're 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 an engineer at a tech company. They're worth millions and millions of dollars. They're worth millions and millions of dollars. Like 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 they've been in a company for years. And I know several people like this. I know another person, similar engineer, who's worth retirement money and they're in their thirties, who on the Saturdays goes to a food bank to volunteer. And like they're really, you know, super nice people. And you ask them like, why are they still working? And it's two reasons. They still work because one, they like to be work and be useful. The other thing is they like the team. They like they like the people they work with. And, and it's not just the idea of the pay that keeps them there. It's the people that can keep you there. And I, I think that that's one of the things that some companies worry about with you know, work from home is you're not as bound anymore because it's just literally you're just bound to your Zoom calls. And I do think there's a very interesting idea of like if you can use these technologies to create that same kind of, you know, the idea of like, oh, we're going to have, we, you know, we, we, we all plug in virtually for three hours, you know, in our space, but we can talk or whatever. It's a very interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can picture almost culturally, no matter, you know, there's where you are in, you know, physical space. And then there's where you are in headspace at any given time. And just as, you know, you spend a certain amount of time at your home or at work or at a Starbucks or whatever, you know, you spent you, you probably have local haunts that you would go to in your uh, headspace. Yeah, and I'll ask you this. Like I've done this with buddies when we're when we're coding stuff. We'll be on a 
Google Meet for several hours. And sometimes if 30 minutes ago, and nobody says anything, but there's literally just having somebody there as you work. Yeah. You know, some things I just want to be left alone, but other things like, yeah, I just want, oh, that's one. Oh yeah, it's cool. Let me take a look at this. So it's just, there is that value. That That's certainly been the case, uh, especially when, you know, uh, Justin was in the Bay Area, we would do World's Greatest Con recording sessions where we would just turn on the video, leave it on and, you know, uh, get up, leave the room, come back and, and okay, you ready? Like as though we were just in a, the physical studio. And I think I think everybody kind of knows we're heading towards that. <laughs> we don't quite know the shape of it, but there is like, you know, Google that project Starlight. There's other uh, efforts to sort of build this sort of present sort of things. Um, and I, I think we may come to like, you know, uh, you know, we may we may come like I was, you know, we've seen those translucent displays that are translucent, but then they can like project an image on there. Like yeah. that might be a kind of neat thing where literally you put a glass display next to you. So literally it's, you're not looking at it as you're looking at it feels like the person sort of there kind of. You know, one thing. thing that we have and nobody's really cracked, but obviously I think there would be a tremendous desire for it is like hands-free FaceTime. Something where you're not, you, you can, you can use both hands, but people really do want to just see each other and be in each other's company. And like, that I guess what you were explaining, uh, main where if you're coding with somebody, you can just leave your your laptop camera on. That that's an example of it. But uh, I think with something like Orion, obviously you have you have the question of like where the camera is pointing. But if people just want to be in each other's presences, there's there's a huge desire for people to just stay on the phone or and specifically be on FaceTime. But you got to kind of like have have your have your hand out or prop your phone up somewhere. Yeah. And I think making what I like about these, it's just a lot. They look a lot lower weight. <laughs> um, I just read an article where somebody was complaining about the glasses and said, well, I don't want to wear them because they look at me. I look like a, you know, a dork. And then I looked at their profile. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> homie, homie, the train left the station. Making no judgments here. Making judgments. <laughs> I think anybody, anybody here in tech or journalism, you know, we got to be very careful when we make judgments on stuff, but, uh, you know, and, and there's already, I, I, I believe like Ray-Ban has a pair of glasses that, uh, can live stream and, uh, and do HD video. That's like really, really capable. I was actually thinking about getting a pair for, uh, the, the, this season, this political season, just so I could like beep. If I'm like at a, at a rally, I can just get the, the fastest, uh, uh, video that i could possibly get well especially because like I, some of them have like buffers that go backwards in time like after the thing happened you can hit it and you got it yeah yeah uh uh but i don't know i think there's it, it's it's a very interesting space but to you know, a larger point that you've made in the past andrew a lot of this is probably going to be developed a lot faster than it would have otherwise number one because you have ai solutions to things and number two just because the manufacturing like where we are with manufacturing right now is in a, a tremendously interesting place like there's a lot of like really really cool prototyping that's happening so another component that they put in there is they use a wristband that basically measures like muscle impulses and stuff and it's funny because like uh you know, Zuckerberg says, "What well, we're we're going for neural control," and you're thinking, "Oh man, you're going to be wired in." Like, well, no, it's a wristband that measures your muscle movements, but still, yeah, it's cool. Because I thought they were going to do the Apple Vision Pro. I thought they were going to like you have a ability of the Apple Watch because you actually have way more data that you can pick up about hand movement, whatever. But they're like they did finger gestures fine, but they have a thing that goes around your wrist that can measure what your hand's doing, which I think is kind of a clever solution because. Now you're not using as much compute in your vision to monitor the hand and to do hand tracking. You know, you can do hand tracking, but limit it to a field of view where the Apple Vision Pro, you can put your finger out to the side and they'll measure that. So it is a very interesting sort of decision to say how, what do you decide to do? What don't you do? Well, here's something that you should do. Patreon.com slash weird things. Head on over there right now and support us. Thank you very much to everybody who does so. Patreon.com slash weird things. Well, what about holograms? Where are our holograms? Who wants Where to are see they? holograms? 
Let's see these holograms. Pop them out. Pop them out, fam. Pop out the grams. So, Brian, I sent you a link. So one of the things we've seen before is acoustic levitation. And that's where you basically use sound to float, let's say, tiny little styrofoam balls. And what you can do with that is you can then light them up. And if you illuminate them, you can get the styrofoam balls to be able to move with incredible precision. And that is that is just paced incredibly. And I think I sent you the right link, Brian. There's one now where what they've been able to do is map objects around and put objects into like a chamber where they're doing the acoustic levitation and move it around it. All right, here we go. Uh, I believe I have it. Hopefully it's lined up here. Here we go. So this, uh, oh, wow. Whoa. Okay, so what we're seeing is, hold on one second. Uh, all right. Uh, wait a minute. Wait, explain how I'm seeing what I'm seeing. Okay, so this version you're seeing right now, the fir there's a couple of, a couple different techniques they're showing in here, okay? So there's the acoustic levitation, where what we're doing is they basically have a particle that's being bounced around, and then colors, like they'll have different colors which will affect it at different positions, so they create the effect of like a butterfly. What we're seeing is a little tiny styrofoam ball spinning around, being moved around with incredible precision very, very fast. So uh, uh, acoustic levitation is basically you got uh, different sonic sources and the interference pattern creates a sweet spot where something very, very light could, could basically get bullied into occupying that space def despite gravity. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. And so what they've been able to do now is be able to map the environment where they're projecting the sound and bounce sound off of things. So in here, like the example you're looking at here, there's two things going on that's pretty cool besides the acoustic levitation. They put like a little plastic rabbit inside the chamber. So now the transducers are bouncing sound off of that object. And then here they've created a little projection screen with four little styrofoam balls holding up like a thin film of let's say silk or some piece of plastic. So they're moving a screen around inside of there that they can project onto it. So, uh, uh, I, I believe you know we're we're seeing a 3D render of everything. Um, have, uh, in this video, do uh, we don't have an actual physical unit? Or? No, you saw that. Then they showed you how it worked with okay. the render. This is the first video. Well, is it working? Get out. Okay, now I see. Uh, what's funny is the the movement was so regular. It 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 looks like a render. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. I. I wish I could describe it uh, in more vivid detail. I need a holograph projector to describe it. Yeah. So acoustic holography is what it's called. And what's exciting about that is the you're you're using your sound to move objects around. This has been around for 20 years. It's been a lot probably older than that. But we've gotten much more precise control over transducers, how to move them around and move these objects much more quickly. So you take a styrofoam ball and you spin it around really, really fast. Here we're seeing it controlling two. And what they do is they basically control it over a other object. And so just the idea that you don't have to have a hollow chamber, the idea that can bounce the sound around it. Um, man, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, like, I mean, I, in theory, there's no reason that all of the the equipment couldn't have a level of precision that allows it to, I mean, essentially look like a, a, a wizard movie effect with particles all swimming around in front of you, creating shapes and everything. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I think it's a matter of precision over time. And there are... We have incredible video displays. You look at what you're, you're, you know, here we're watching objects move under a table, under a little plastic Lego table. That's crazy. And so, you know, you think about like our, our phone displays and our laptop displays are the process of billions of dollars and, you know, a lot of huge intense competition. These acoustic displays for the most part are just, you know, the domain of some laboratories and a few startups trying to make it. We haven't seen billions of dollars of investments in there into miniaturizing the transducers and to really sort of think about what else can be done. So I do think that Star Wars like holograms are going to be a reality, you know, whether it will be a vapor mist that's controlled by sound, you know, to do it or some other media. I think there needs to be some sort of medium that you have to reflect off of. 
but we're seeing the precision that you can do now with these acoustic holograms and um you know these chambers obviously need you know the transducers on either side but the demo that makes it the most concrete by the way if you just search it's a multi-sensory devices group and if you uh, uh, the title is High Speed Acoustic Holography with ar Holography with, with Arbitrary Scattering Objects, Levitation Over Obstacles. But but one of the bits shows, uh, you know, four uh, pellet balls holding a screen that, that just begins to, like, the fact that it starts off spinning slowly and then ramps up fast enough that it becomes like a refresh display, just like a CRT, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Exciting things to come. We'll see how the technology keeps progressing. So a couple other advancements. Um, there have been a, in the AI space, we've seen some, some more models. Meta announced uh, their multimodal and their, uh, let me get into the, uh, or the Llama 3.2 models, uh, which seem to be very, very good. So they have their new 3.2 models, which are have vision. Which means they're able to wow. look at you know see things, and they've released some small models. Like, um, I guess want to do a really quick demo here. I'll show you with the new. They have one that's one billion parameters, and so literally think of one billion parameters as roughly like a gig. It takes like it would take a gigabyte of memory to run on. Mm -hmm. um, where the models that we're used to, the much bigger ones, are measured in like the the biggest model that we had to put out is four hundred and five billion parameters. So mm -hmm. do we want to see? Let's see what a um, three point. Let's go look at a one billion parameter model. Let's we'll see what it can do. I'm going to share my window with you. Okay. I'll see if I have a shot set up where we can all see it. And hope that I don't have any embarrassing bookmarks or things here. Uh, so <laughs> hold on. Let me see if I can. There we go. I click on my API keys, show you all that. So here we're in, this is on grok, G R O Q dot com. This is the company that makes their own fast. Uh, oh, this is the one that you showed hardware. that was just like bonkers fast. Yeah. So you can choose different models. Like we have, um, we're going to use the 1 billion parameter preview. Like this is the smallest model. This is a very small model. And I'm going to say, uh, write a podcast, a weird things podcast episode about a cyborg rabbit. Rabbit hosts are Brian. Andrew and Justin. I say right by transcript. Okay. All right. I'm going to set the tokens up to the max. All right. Give as many tokens okay. as possible. So, so we'll give you, you a sense of this. I assume it'll be fast. So I'll say exactly when you hit, or you could say when you hit go. Okay. Three, two, one. And it's done. Wow. Uh, that was 2,000 tokens per second. It took 375 milliseconds to generate. Apparently, we have a guest. Wow. That's great. Uh, they did invent Peter, the host and author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it is a 1 billion parameter right. model. It is. Uh, but yeah, so it, it is a, a, a tiny, tiny, tiny model that you could run on your phone easily. Um, but won't generate this fast because this is using a high speed inference. But just to show you like where, you know, what what's capable. So let's let's go step up. Let's go ahead and use the three billion parameter model, which is probably a more useful one. Uh, we didn't get any inventions there. Um, you guys want to read this? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Welcome to Weird Things. I'm your host, Brian. Joining me today are Andrew and Justin. We're here to explore the weird and bizarre. Hey, everyone. I've got a fascinating story for you today. That's right. Today, we're talking about a cyborg rabbit that's been making headlines in the world of scientific experimentation. A cyborg rabbit? That sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. Tell us more, Justin. So, it all started a few years ago when a team of scientists at the University of Colorado created a genetically engineered rabbit with microchips implanted into its brain. The goal was to study the effects of artificial intelligence on a small animal. I see. So this rabbit was basically a lab rat with a twitchy eye. 
Eh, not exactly. The scientists were able to interface the rabbit's brain with a computer system, allowing it to perform complex tasks and even learn from its environment. But things took a weird turn when the researchers started leaving the lab and the cyborg rabbit escaped. Is <laughs> it escaped cyborg rabbit? That's like something out of a bad horror movie. But it gets even weirder. According to eyewitnesses, the rabbit has been causing chaos in the local community, digging up gardens and knocking over trash cans. And the funniest part is that the scientists are trying to catch it using a combination of high-tech surveillance and carrots. Carrots? Really? What's the logic behind that? <laughs> well, apparently the rabbit has a weakness for carrots, and whoever can offer the carrot is the one who gets to catch it without harming it. I guess you could say the rabbit is in control of the situation. Uh, and then we're going to play back a cyborg rabbit on the loose clip from the BBC. We have reports coming in of a genetically engineered rabbit causing chaos in the town of Golden, Colorado. Eyewitnesses claim the rabbit, dubbed Cyborg Money, has been digging up gardens and knocking over trash cans. The University, the University of, Col of Colorado has confirmed that one of the researchers created the rabbit as part of an experiment on artificial intelligence. That's right. The university is offering a reward for anyone who can catch the rabbit without harming it. But some people are questioning the ethics of creating a sentient being, no matter how bionic it is. I think this is a perfect example of how science can get out of control. And what about the moral implications of creating a cyborg rabbit? Do we have the right to play God? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Oh, well, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Weird Things. If you have any thoughts on the cyborg rabbit, send us an email or join the conversation on our social media channels. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for more weird and interesting stories. See you next time on Weird Things. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, it's a better show. Better show. <laughs> Big upgrade. So that's a three billion parameter model. You could run that on your iPhone. You could run that on your iPhone. That's, and it was that's capable, wild. And it gave us a beginning, a middle, and an end. I mean, it's just it's just absolutely where we are now with yeah. the improvements. Like small models, by the way, pro tip, if you want to do creative tasks where you're not worried about things like facts, small models are actually really useful because... Their propensity for hallucination means they will often go off into directions that are more interesting. So, mm. yeah. Totally so this agreed. is Llama three point two, the three billion perimeter, three billion parameter model. Um, we can try. Uh, they have an eleven billion. They have a vision. So the vision. What's significant about the vision model is that allows you to, you know, look at the vision capability here. You know, like you can look at images, etc. So. Um, Kind of cool. I wonder if I could see the vision if they would let me do a. Can I upload? Um, I don't know. I have to play with that some later time. We'll get into that. So, kind of cool. Yeah. No. It's 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 a uh, uh, it's insane, and and that's part of the reason why I'm so bullish on a lot of this, and and especially in our conversations, Andrew, is that we haven't really grokked what it means to have LLMs that are this fast, this capable, and this small to the point where they are essentially free and what it means when you're building a product that you now have a freemium tier. You know, what? one of the things that uh, was was a, an initial critique of ai like a, a year and a half ago and really only the frontier models were there is that like well do you really need at the price of uh, uh you know uh, taking a taking a bugatti to take out the trash right is this too expensive of a process to do something very simple and what's changed in that time is exactly what we just saw things that are really really slow uh, sorry really really fast really really small and are incredibly inexpensive that can do a lot of the simple stuff leaving the big llms to do more complex things like i wanted to figure out how many times over the last 20 years what the record of the university of miami's uh, football team the hurricanes were in a week where an actual hurricane hit the state of florida and i found out that they're five and six over the last 20 years thanks to a one preview. <laughs>
Uh, man, I can't express enough. Like, historians are going to see uh, a, an incredible rise in humans' knowledge of arcane trivia that nobody <laughs> would have expected uh, as a result of AI because those moments of I wonder, suddenly that itch is, is easier than ever to scratch. Well, and it's the same thing that we had when the mobile internet became a thing. And, and there was the conversation of like, well, well we're never going to have a bar argument about, uh, you know, who led the league in hits because now there's always going to be somebody with a, a smartphone. And to a large extent, that became true. But what AI allows us to do, you know, with some fact checking on, on the back end, obviously, is just sort of frack a lot of this knowledge that's been built up on onto the internet and has become harder and harder to find as other things have built up around it. Like for example, for PX3, I was doing, uh, the, the episode that's out today is a debate prep episode where I watched uh, an old debate with JD Vance and a debate with Tim Walls, right? Here's the problem with modern Google. Do your best to try to use the world's premier search engine to find a debate, an old debate of J.D. Vance or Tim Walls without knowing who they debated uh, within the first five pages. Because the only thing that they're going to surface for you are preview articles about the fact that they're going to debate each other next week. It's becoming harder and harder to find a... Uh, uh, data that if you want to put together and create stuff and and that's what a lot of these search well, it, engines and, and and the computational power behind it is just a uh, uh, staggering like I, I i'm i'm using it for dumb stuff but uh, the, the the power behind it the reasoning behind it is just uh amazing well and uh it's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's so strange to me that this moment of ai is being very good at giving direct answers or or, or at least, you know, uh, citing sources and stuff is happening right as the search engines seem to be less useful than ever because um, uh, more and more public forums are just putting their stuff behind the no robots.txt thing that 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 prevents Google from crawling. So as a result, you do a Google search, like uh, you're you're forced to only know what Reddit thinks of things. Everything else is not public or, or you're, it's filled with ads on the front page, or it's 17 versions of the same, you know, if it's health-related, you're going to get the same Mayo Clinic article 12 ways. Re, and, re, rebarfed. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and it's, it's it, 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 to be honest, I feel a little bit of anxiety about it because the internet has always felt so expansive and so wide, and, and there was always so much out there. And now, uh, because of, you know, over the years, our increased reliance on Google as it got better and better, not so much at giving us what we want, but what serves Google's needs, which is, you know, yeah. driving ads and so on. Uh, the internet feels subjectively smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden it feels bigger again. Thanks. But, but only when I'm talking to one of the robots, you want to know what's amazing. I had this realization this week. Have you ever been searching for stuff and seen surfaced on Google? the hindu stand times yes quite a bit like like I, and i have no idea like oh maybe it's maybe it's the the bbc of 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 hindustan which is uh, uh <laughs> that's that's the proper name for india right i don't know i, I think an no older idea. name i yeah. think it's an older name but yeah yeah, yeah sorry, i have uh, no idea what the hindu stand times is but i realized this week i'm like oh i'll bet you they really 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 push google ad conversions because that's I'm almost assured the reason why it shows up in like the top three, it's represented as if it were the LA times, as if it were a, a, a top flight American resource based on the stuff that it services, which is not about news in India. It's about news in all, America. All over the world. About, yeah. It, it, it yeah. makes me wonder if it's like the BBC of India or, or whether or not it's just a fluke that, it shows up in excellently positioned uh, searches. Yeah, I, I, I have not. Uh, I'll, I'll do a little searching here, but uh, a little live whatever investigation. It is, whatever it is, it is uh, 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 done very, very well for itself in terms of uh, Google. That's it. I uh, meanwhile, 
you know, the one of the challenges I have is the weird thing is website. I've had that domain for fifteen years. Twenty. Yeah. No, oh, I, 24, 26 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the website, yeah, the website's probably the WordPress thing is getting on 18 years old. Uh, and so it's funny because like trying to make like right now I go to log in. I can't even find the website. Website just disappeared. I just did I just did some update to put some new security fence around it. And we talk about you know starting the topic about these tiny little models. My God, to to have a little model that just follows every key click, everything I do, and keep track of what I did would be invaluable. There there are some approximations that uh uh like I find myself scrolling back through uh like if I'm trying to remember who was where when I'll scroll back through my my photo archive and then it's like I can tell I'm at such and such conf conference at this time because I just have like a block of 16 photos of other people's badges just so it's like future Brian will know that you had a good interesting conversation with this person and at this conference and, and I, I wonder how soon an AI assistant will be able to synthesize that and uh, prompt me to, you know, hey, uh, you probably talked about following up with this person. I, I mean, it's really comes down to we're really in the engineering phase. You know, we're at the point now where, uh, you know, you can you can build a thing and it just depends, you know, the, the models like here, like we saw how a one, a, you know, three billion parameter model is really good for a lot of little things. And if you want bigger, it's fine. GPT-40 mini is super cheap to use. You just have to figure out how you plug it into everything. You know, it's it's really the models are there. Yeah. Y'all got any picks? Uh, I got one. I gobbled up a book in like two days. Um, uh, Jason Pargin used to write under the name David Wong. Wrote a book, John Dies at the End. Uh, he's got a new book under the name Jason Pargin, which he writes under now, um, called uh, I'm Beginning to Get Worried About This Black Box of Doom. And uh, it, it quite literally begins with a character who encounters a black box of doom and is tasked to transport it and uh, characters, uh, you, you find out about them and things happen and it's good. Uh, but because uh, Jason Pargin has a long storied history with uh, the website that eventually got bought and became cracked.com, uh, you know, he's he does a lot of uh, clever thinky, uh, essays and within the dialogue scenes between the two characters, you find yourself kind of in the middle of a back and forth dialogue driven cool essay that belongs at crack.com where you yeah. find out about how guinea worms worked and how horrific they were. And there's a, you know, this great moment where in a bid to explain that the world is not getting worse, one character explains guinea worms and says, you know, 30 years ago, there were 3 million cases. Last year, there were 15. And he goes, 15 million? And she says, no, 15 cases in the planet of this thing now. That's what the world is just getting better and better. So uh, if you like those kind of moments, if you like um, learning some stuff, uh, and, and seeing a, a wacky adventure happen, it felt like Snow Crash set in the modern day uh and whereas snow crash would treat it like a crazy idea that a corporation might have its own currency we now live in that future where yes. thanks to the blockchain <laughs> corporations can have currencies and uh quite literally when snow crash came out the idea of a gigantic ga of a gas station with 120 pumps that sold ammunition and jerky and clothing and first aid kits and survivalist uh, infrastructure was crazy. Now it's Bucky's. And, it's Bucky's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, uh, it, if, if you enjoyed Snow Crash and you wondered what Snow Crash would feel like, just held up as a funhouse mirror of today, uh, uh, read the book. Uh, it's, it's the brand new one from Jason Pargin. That's great. Uh, he's he's a, a great follow, too, on, on all platforms. Yeah, his uh, TikToks he... are a lot of fun. Yeah. So I'm a fan of professional wrestling and uh, one of uh, the long gestating projects that was rumored to maybe not even see the light of day 
uh, is now out on Netflix. It is called Mr. McMahon. It is from the people who brought you Tiger King, and it began, I think, four years ago, five years ago, as a very rare opportunity where Vincent Kennedy McMahon, the person or a junior that uh, brought WWF, now WWE, to prominence as a gigantic pop culture brand, uh, wanted to tell his story. In the meanwhile, throughout all that, he was, he left his company, he returned to his company, he sold his company, and then eventually was absolutely run out after a crazy uh, uh, lawsuit came down where uh, text messages between him and a woman who says that uh, he sexually assaulted her came to light. I am only two and a half episodes into the six episode series. I will say that it is far more for people who are not hardcore wrestling fans than it is for people that are hardcore wrestling fans because a lot of the stories that are in there if you are a sicko like I am and you've paid attention to this for a long time they're they're going over ground there's little nuggets here and there that that you that you are picking up on and it's interesting to hear it through Vince's own words but the documentary itself seems to center around this one central idea of where is the line between the actual person, Vince McMahon, and the character that he portrayed on television of Mr. McMahon, the megalomaniacal, psychotic boss who makes all of his female talent sleep with him. Uh, where is where is the line, and especially in the bizarre, carny world of professional wrestling, does he? even know where that line is, especially considering what wound up happening to him. So I'm not at the point where they had to pivot. Apparently the, the documentary was almost entirely done by the time that they, uh, that all the news essentially gave them, you know, a totally new lens on this. But uh, I, I will say if it, it, it's, it's far more a, work of art if you want to show it to people that have no idea what is happening with with wrestling or why people should care about it. it it does a very capable job of explaining bit by bit how wrestling was at the forefront of technology and pop culture in, in a really special way and shows you how bizarre everybody involved in it is because they're all just what, absolute uh, what, what platform lunatics. is that on netflix okay uh, yeah, and, pro wrestling is, is yeah, carnies with on steroids. <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The steroid stuff in there. I'm, I'm just at the end of the steroid trial. Uh, it, it's also, it gets great interviews with some of the famous wrestlers like Hulk Hogan. Some great quotables from Hulk Hogan like, yeah, dude, I just, I really self destructed myself during all that time. Uh, talking about steroid usage, why he lied on Arsenio Hall about how he had only done steroids three times. Uh, uh, it was, yeah, it's... That was it's not good. a lie. That was true. The 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> um, two, two things. Uh, uh, I went back to check on Andor to see if it was still good. Oh, hmm. I've been worried about it. Is it? Amazing. It's better than you remember. Uh, uh, so uh, just the other day, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, somebody was asking, like, what are good shows? And it was me and editor Brant. And uh, we got to Andor. And it, it's amazing how difficult it is to try to oversell Andor. And you still feel like you didn't do a good enough job of explaining how it's the best Star Wars anything that has ever been. What's the thing that in rewatching it, what I really love. And the thing that I think that's why so many other shows suck and people kind of go like, you know, well, why don't you like this or why don't you like that? Because Andor is this the story of Andor. It's the story of his mom. It's the story of uh, uh, it's the Axel, you know, uh, Luthen, right? You oh, know, yeah. I, it's, it's, it, also it's this. Oh, go ahead. So it's a story of that up and coming uh, dude who has to go to the space. I'm making Bronx. my list, Brian. 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 It's the story of that guy. <laughs> it's the story of the ISB security woman. It's the story of the, the, the anti everybody. There are these, like, there are 10 people in there that you follow their fates and you want to know what's going to happen to them. It really is kind of keep game of Thrones level. Good at it too. Yeah. You're uh, gonna just find every it. time. Yeah, every time you meet a new character, you're like, I'm into this character, and I wonder what's going to happen if they ever run into this other character that I really like. Yeah, you have you have the guy, the the guy, the 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 security guy who starts as Brian brought up, who kind of creates makes it difficult for Andor, and then you cut to him getting his having his mother berate him as he eats his space cereal. <laughs> And you feel bad for this guy, oh, and then God. you cut just, to when, when, when he just goes full full Scorsese of the mom, like just just hectoring him, and just like, oh. oh, this is so good. And then then the the woman who runs I the ISB woman who was getting denied her request because she's trying to protect the Empire, and you're like, yeah, why won't you let her have these files? Why are you in her way? Cut to her torturing one of the people we like. And you're like, well, why don't you just tell her what you know? <laughs> you yeah. Know? It's just, I would uh, watch an entire series about the Imperial like security bureau, you know? Oh like, yeah. Like, and, 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 and just that, just that story that they told uh, about the how and why of the interrogation technique and, and the uh, oblivious, like really quite curious how interesting uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, the doctor uh, who's like not mustache trail. He's like, oh, we recorded the sound and it'll, it'll make you confess to anything. <laughs> Here, listen. <laughs> you know, I, I I watched a YouTube essay that was linked somewhere on Reddit about you know it was complaining about House of the Dragon and specifically one writer who's caught in, who's caught a lot of criticism for her episodes and decisions that were made on the show. And it, the the essay, which I didn't get to the end of, but I saw enough of to get the gist is kind of an examination of whether or not that criticism is warranted. And essentially what it boiled down to is that Game of Thrones, and specifically David Benioff and Weiss, uh, were the best we possibly have ever seen in an episodic uh, uh, situation of adapting George R. R. Martin's work. Obviously, things wound up falling apart when there wasn't any literal text to translate and they were burnt out blah 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 right that that's been litigated a million times but what happened was you went from a lot of literary tropes which is what andor is also very good at of let's bring these people along let's create mysteries where they're going to be let's not rush to pay off everything and we're also going to deny you the exciting thing in lieu of character development so when the exciting thing happens, when the spectacle shows up, you are thrilled. You're really excited because you're invested in all of the characters. And now the big explosion means so much more. And that both Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon have fallen into the trap of spectacle for spectacle's sake that doesn't have the proper lead up of investment in characters and then no consequence. And what they point out, spoilers for House of the Dragon, but there's a scene at the end of the first season where a gigantic dragon essentially you know there's no way that it couldn't kill hundreds of peasants by uh, uh by by exploding out of the, the the basement of this building and then menaces some people and flies away and as the the youtuber pointed out we never find out whether or not this is like a, a a 9-11 level event for the small folk of King's <laughs> Landing. We never see a conversation about uh, uh, whether or not the people that were spared, uh, that were in the high family, that they feel lucky that that they're going to happen or angry uh, uh, that, they, that they weren't killed, that they were humiliated. And we never see anybody in, you know, from the family that had the dragon that caused it. We never see whether or not they have any feelings about it. It's just a thing that happened because it's really cool to think of. And then a dragon pops out of a basement and sneers at, at this character. And that's where I think Andor is just amazing. Every moment matters. Every moment reverberates. Every moment leads to another moment. And, you know, my favorite scene in that series is where, you know, you kind of get some hard truths about the world of spies and espionage. And that comes from a drip, drip, drip 
of one character that can go from, you know, Jack Bauer level serious to Liberace silly, but all of it mattered by the time that you see him deliver this monologue. It it just it all hits like an anvil because you see what it matters, what what it means to him when he kind of lays all of his cards down. So uh, great stuff. Really, yeah, I, I wish more television was like that. Yeah, it's it, the, the some of the best advice on writing, you know, came from uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone. And it kind of sums down, comes down to like, if this is true, what else is true? And because of this, this happens because of this, this happens. And when you watch like House of Dragons, you see like, oh, like they took a book. And they just sort of summarize this chapter and turn it into a script, summarize a chapter, turn it into a script. And, and then they're moving action figures around a board. It's like why there's a lot of lot of, a lot of writers and particularly like genre films I just hate because it's like you literally just wanted to have these two characters fight here. So you just you just blah, blah, blah. And they fight and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. this and blah, blah, blah. And we're here. And then the frustrating thing about the latest season, House of Dragons, like Damien has this very interesting moment. It takes like five episodes to get to <laughs> that could have been done in two would be an interesting place. And the criticism I keep hearing over and over again is, yeah, the season finale felt like the episode before the season finale. And, you know, I watched, I have not watched the new season of Ring of Power. I, I watched the first Rings of Power and I'm like, this <laughs> yeah. is just, it turns out you've got a lot of <laughs> in common with America. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> and, and the, the numbers have gone up or whatever, but it was just, I'm like, this the example I give is that like what happens is bidding off on Weiss had to fight to be able to get convinced George R. Martin to let them adapt it. And they, the, the story is like, you know, who is his, you know, who is Stark's mother or whatever, the kind of question that they asked or, you know, these things that, you know, like that, let me know that you really understand the work that you really get the work. The way Hollywood works is somebody hears, you know, uh, an agent hears, hey, I hear HBO is trying to do an adaptation of this. And they talk to a couple of their favorite writers. I can get you a meeting. Can you go in and make them a pitch? They're like, well, I haven't read it. Let me talk to some friends. They go in, they pick up the book. They go watch some YouTube videos. They, they speed read the book, go through it, go into the meeting. Oh, I love this. I love this character. I love this. I've been a fan. I've been this. This happened to comic movies a lot is you get these people like, I'm not saying you have to fake fandom, but you should know the material. You know, you should really know the material. And you get a lot of people that just, you saw that with Witcher and other stuff where yeah, the people, they don't care. They, yes, they, because to get, they literally, be, they liked it to get a job. They liked the material to get a job. And then the first thing they want to do is, ah, you know, this really, we need to change this. We need to change it. Sometimes you, I, I'm all for adapting to things in different forms. It's fine. But so much the business is really driven by, because the exec wants to get some hot writer and they want to tell their boss, oh yeah, she's a big fan. He loved it. He was, he's a big, he loved it. He knew this stuff, whatever. And you can, it shows, it just shows. It's like, you think about how controversial it was when Peter Jackson and Philip Boyana, uh, and they were, uh, redoing Lord of the Rings. And we heard, you know, that they were rewriting stuff. They were changing the timelines and how controversial that was that was going on. Um, but the, the end result of, yeah, Fran Walsh, yeah, sorry, Peter Jackson, Fran Walsh, and Philip Williams, the three of them, they had to make changes to fit it into a movie-making thing. In retrospect, we go, man, Lord of the Rings, the film, was like the greatest trilogy of films we've ever had. It holds up. It's, it's, we, 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 we get that it's a different telling, Yeah, but we nobody doubts the love and compassion they had for that storytelling. And you start to listen to them talk about it. I'm like, be like, Oh, well, you know, Balrog doesn't have this. And Peter Jack, like, well, you know, in 422 of the compendium, da, 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 you're like, yeah. Oh, he's a bigger nerd than me. Yeah. Um, so, but that's not my pick. Ah, alien Romulus. Oh, do you like it? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I, to be honest with you. I, when I saw the trailer, I'm like, I'm kind of done with the creature on a spaceship we got to get away from the creature story because it's done it's just done it is a done story there's just not a lot of places you can go with it to make it exciting and every time kind of they come up with when they would decided they were going to return to sort of roots for that i was not terribly excited about it but i have to say from a production point of view the characters everything else i thought they did a really good job of it really enjoyable story um you know, the background is some young people working on a Wayland yutani planet, which uh, 
they, uh, you know, young, the, the lead protagonist, you know, she's ready to go transfer off role. And she goes to show up to get her transfer papers. And they're like, I'm sorry, we've doubled your terms of engagement. Nothing we can do. And you're like, you can, like it's kind of like, kind of like the empire in Andor. You're kind of like, yeah. oh man, like, I'm like, I want to see this whole world of like what it's like working for Wayland Yutani because this is kind of a really horrific dystopian futuristic thing where, but anyhow, um, and it gets into the aliens. I, I enjoyed it. So I really enjoyed, you know, I'm not going to like, ah, it's the best mo- alien movie ever. Maybe third best. <laughs> really? Hey, day, day, that's, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's like, it's like, it's one of those franchises like Terminator where it's like, just give me. Give me something that you can well, they, just at least they, play along with the first two. They get into, and this is cool because it takes place after Alien. They get into, uh, they don't go deep into like like with with Alien Covenant and uh, uh, Alien uh, <laughs> Resurrection or Boogaloo. Yeah, <laughs> the 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 last couple Alien movie Prometheus is. I love Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott gets into some myth building and story building that kind of goes way off on a thing. It's like, I think you need to be making some other franchise for this. Like there's yeah. fran- I want to see your uh, you know, um uh von Daniken fingerprints of the gods, whatever, you know, uh story. I want to I want to see that. I want to watch that. Story. Yeah, because that was more where they were going with that one when it yeah. when it when it begins with the the a member of the white man group committing suicide and you're like <laughs> the white man group <laughs> uh chariots of the gods sorry yeah. i think uh, I, actually yeah. i i rather i thought you i thought fingerprints of the gods is even more poetic because it uh uh it, it implies that you could still see you know the signs of their handiwork well i think that's another book though i think that actually is uh that's by graham hancock that was his book ah okay uh yeah, but anyhow, yeah, yeah, chariots of the gods. But anyhow, like, uh, like, uh, like yeah, just do uh, do a whole step from that. But. A, a quick story on on chariots of the gods. Uh, when I took the pseudoscience class back at, at UT, um, <laughs> the the professor pointed up. Uh, uh, he pointed out that the European edition and the American edition have a strange anomaly about them. Uh, the pages, like the pages, read in one order. Uh, in the American version and in a totally different order in the European version. And it, it, like, it's as though in transporting them, somebody dropped a few pages, scooped them up and then set them back into the manuscript and they just printed them in a different order. And because it's filled with so much garbage nonsense, literally nobody noticed <laughs> people wow. read just jibber jabber page to page and didn't notice it while while it sold millions of copies my favorite thing from chariots of the gods in the earliest like the first edition is von daniken which is a story you know, inspired many people is one of his strong evidence that like the olmecs or whatever who are making like these skulls like you know carving skulls oh that, yeah the, they, the crystal skulls well, yeah, well, the crystal skulls, we you know, are like, like fakes, but like even the skulls, like even the skulls, the, just the jewelry and stuff, they're like, how could they know what a skull looks like without an x-ray? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was in the book. That the was in the book. The old-fashioned way. That's how. Yeah. A little elbow grease. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been weird. I gotta use the bathroom. All right, that's going to be in there. <laughs> try, try to. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> Got to use the bathroom. Uh, Actually, that's easy to cut, cut out. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ledwin, uh, I agree. Uh, Prey was amazing. Uh, I went back and started rewatching that. Uh, it was great because you would think that the stakes only feel lower uh, in a out of step time frame with the technology being so primitive. But the fact that there seemed to be a code of honor about the uh, hunters, uh, the predators, where it's like, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta match their skill set. You or, or sorry, you gotta match not their skill set, their technology set, and play with the same weapons under the same rules. Uh, I, I liked it. I liked what they did with that. Although I guess I guess even then there was a technological advantage. Maybe there's some kind of some kind of rule where it's like you're only allowed to be this many years ahead of them. 
Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, Ledwin. Uh, there's there's a much like the uh, Steve Jobs reality distortion field. There's an Arnold Schwarzenegger reality distortion field because you go back, you watch that opening, and all of a sudden, all you care about is how giant muscles are and how bad communists must be that they need to be in Nicaragua or El Salvador or wherever this is in Central America to stop communism by burning villages or whatever it is they ostensibly were starting to do. By the way, uh, I was a kid when Predator came out and my uncle took me and I didn't really know, like it had kind of a cool uh, video screen effect on the movie poster, but I had no idea there were aliens in it. I had just seen Commando a whole bunch on HBO. And so I knew who Arnold Schwarzenegger was. And that opening scene, I'm like, why is there a spaceship? Like, I was able to buy in fully to that whole experience. Also, it was an early rated R movie for me. So it's like that scene where the arm flops down and it's still pulling the trigger on that gun. I was like, I had never seen nothing like that. That was incredible. They were sent to rescue somebody from the communist brain. Okay. All right. <laughs> but, but, but my point stands, which is like, just by proximity to Schwarzenegger, you stop to, you, you're like, I just know awesome when I see it. <laughs> yeah. But then he could go do red heat and play a commie. Yeah. Brian missed that. Yeah. Ran off. R U N N O F T. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. So, trying to find out what happened to weirdthings.com. <laughs> it's just gone. <laughs> oh, no. Well, apparently we know we you know our training data made it into AI, so you know we'll live on this <laughs> capacity. Yeah, it is just a just a hole on the internet, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Yes, I will upgrade for this new WordPress protection software. Click. <laughs> oh, man. oh, you're protected, all right. <laughs> Exactly. Protected. Nobody will get to the site now. By oblivion. Yeah, site is gone. I had to send it. I upgrade, did it, did an upgrade where they do the install. I'm like, oh, we're going to do it at like 6 a.m. I'm like, sure, cool, done. And then I didn't check. I'm like, I got to go make sure the latest episodes upload. I go to where things, where's my, where's my site? <laughs> Good Lord. Good Lord. All right. <clears throat> Beep, bop, boop. You ready, sir? Ready. All right, three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Brian Brushwood. Hey, howdy, hey, y'all. So I've been in the process of building out a company with my wife, and one of the things that's kept me up at night is trying to figure out how to manage all the information. Because when you build a tech project, you have your tech stack, which is going to be your application. You have your admin layer for your application. You have your code, which is where the code goes. Then you have to figure out how you handle customer support, how you have to you know, facilitate you know, all of your data, where it goes. And then with the idea that if you're eventually going to hire people and bring people on, how do you onboard them? How do you get them into so they know where things are? Having been up close now to a couple tech companies and watching that process and to see how how much of a challenge it can be when you kind of come into a thing to try to figure out, like, what do I do? What's next? Whatever. You, there is never a perfect solution. Never, ever, ever a perfect solution. But there are bad solutions. Mm. And there are better solutions. So that's what I've been going through right now. And the... One thing I was trying to do was to figure out, like, how do I, you know, for my code, you know, I, you know, I use GitHub to store my code. So all of my, you know, all of my code gets saved up there. I have readmes, which are, you know, documents that explain what the code does. But there's a lot of things to go from like a wait list, to letting people on, to managing who are your customers, if you're doing the customer interviews, et cetera. So 
I spent a lot of time looking around trying to figure out what I want to do. And there are a lot of little services out there that will do certain things like, oh, we'll do customer thing. We'll do this. We'll do that. But every organization, every tech company I'm aware of falls into sort of a process by which things run. So Apple is very email. Apple's a very email culture. And so basically you, you write stuff in emails, you send stuff to emails, things go back and forth to emails. You know, as of my friends who left there, they weren't using Slack. It was a very email focused sort of thing. So that, that was sort of the way that it functioned, which has pros and cons, but that's, you know, your email account is your company. Uh, OpenAI was Slack and Google Docs, like Google Drive. Like it was yeah. very, very Slack, very, very, very Slack heavy. Documents would be Google Docs, whatever. You know, that was sort of the way you do stuff. You, if you, you'd see this today, you know, when you, you know, I just got sent a thing for the OpenAI Dev Day you know, a form and it's a Google form. So you can know what their workspace is. Uh, our friend at Twitter told me that they used a lot of Google workspace, like a lot of Google drive, like docs within docs within docs, like just linking a Google doc to another Google doc to another Google doc. And so I decided to go with notion and because I can plug Google Docs into that, I can plug Slack into it, and I can do that. But like, have no, and I, 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 I was hesitant because I would get people when I would work sometimes be like, oh, I created a Notion page for this, and I'm like, did we have to do a Notion page for this if we already have Google Drive integrated or we have Slack? Do we need to go have another? Th and that was always my frustration: is people would like managers get excited about some new management thing to bring in. It's like, cool, now I've got five different sign-ons. I have to yeah. think about you where to go, and. So I went with the reason I went with Notion was you can do a lot within there. And the way I had to re-sort of frame it was thinking of like, you know, note about because Notion, I started to think, well, it's 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 pages within pages, but really you know, it's it's databases linked to databases to link to databases with pages. And and you can think of Notion where you can have groups, teams, bring people in. You know, I have uh for my Notion thing right now, I have a whole task list to set up, I have a project board, I have this. And so what I'm building out for my wife and for her company is basically you know, it'll be the center of the company that we build out from, you know, that'll, that'll be the starting point to know, you know, that we have a Google workspace account where your email is, you know, and, but for docs and stuff, notion is the plan. You know, I, it's, it, it's something that I think is, it, it has a lot of different advantages to it. And it's also the most recently built out of the three solutions that you, that you mentioned, you know, Google docs has become ubiquitous because it is free and it is reliable, but it certainly is not a product that has seen a lot of revisions over the past, you know, decade and a half. Uh, Slack is. Uh, of you know <laughs> something that is that is both great and terrible uh it, it 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 did a lot to slay repetitive emails but it also uh uh can have the problem of uh of, of being a a echo chamber or bringing chat room politics into a more uh a professional and it's environment it's, it's a it's also like quasi public it's a bit like conducting your business live on twitter we're, we're yeah i mean remember that was something that was a very exciting idea back in the day you had products like yammer that were like hey like t twitter's great let's figure out a way to do it and slack very much was from that that mindset and to a certain extent it, it, it was born out of the world of we need to kill email email sucks and i think we have since come around on email <laughs> email uh, uh you know we're like i don't know man email kind of works email's kind of good uh, uh we can be better about it but we can have better tools within email but maybe we don't need to kill email where notion not only is something that is simple enough that you can grok it really easy but it is consistently i i don't think it's really even close to where its final form is going to be as they've been very aggressive in terms of adding things and making it something that is dynamic not only for coding stuff but also for you know folding in ai stuff making notions public is a whole nother element to it so i think there's there's a lot of really really exciting uh exciting capabilities to it and andrew i'm 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 excited that uh that you that you made the call to to try to build out the the resourcing from it a couple things happened over time when they first launched i played with it and i wasn't it was slow and i wasn't like ter it, it it terribly impressed and I, I i think that i get why people like it and it's kind of one of the things like figma where 
you kind of had to not be a developer to build it. You had to be a person kind of out there in sort of the real world and say, because like, because that notion is an example of it's not 10x better at anything, but what it does do is it puts documents and databases really close together and a database approach towards that. And then then when you put it in the hierarchy, it allows you to range it. I was impressed with the AI feature the, they've integrated. They have both OpenAI and they have Anthropic in there and the way they integrated across there, which Google and everybody else is doing too. But it was nice that like I write a bunch of notes about my code and I just go ask the AI like, hey, what was my solution for this? You'd said this in this document right here on this page, which everything's going in that direction. But, you know, it's 10 bucks, $10 a month add on. And I was really impressed because I was in the middle of uh, documenting something because I have like an agent based approach for how I write my GPT or my AI completions. And I like, man, it'd be really if somebody else is coming along, it'd be really helpful to have a chart. And so I'm like, uh, you make a diagram of this to the AI, and it made a diagram of it. It was a neat flashback because two years ago, we had a hackathon at OpenAI, and we were playing around GPT 3.5, and we knew it was good at code, and so I was curious to see if it understood how to do diagrams because there's a diagramming platform for JavaScript called mermaid.js, which uses a pretty simple notation of like, you know, Brian, Arrow, Justin, Arrow, you know, podcast or whatever it'll then create a diagram of that and i said oh can you make a diagram of this and it spat out the markup for the diagram i plugged it into the interpreter and it there was my diagram and so i did that an open AI hackathon an internal hackathon i showed that and it was the first time people were seeing a gpt model create like really complex visuals other than like a react button and it was like a really neat oh my god it understood the relationship between because i had to do a transformer you know, describe a transformer with attention mechanism with this. And and that was cool. And then just fast forward, it's just one of the many features you can do. You just to say, hey, give me a diagram. And it was like cool to see probably the first person to ever see an AI do this to now see just two years later, anybody. It's can just, just a thing that you can do in Notion. Yeah. Cool. It's just so cool to like just see this the adoption and you know i had a thing where i have to you know writing databases i have to like create like you know the sql commands to go do that which is a pain and when we first saw that gpt3 could write sql if you want to structure a database i just go into notion and chat gpt will do this of course but just go into notion in the middle of my documentation like oh this table has these features dot 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 and here is the command to create the table spouts out the command copy paste into superbase there's the table very cool. So uh, I've always been fearful, like when we first encountered Notion, uh, there was, you know, a lot of the questions we had, are like, how, does it play well with other space or other space or other space? So I, I always wondered if Notion would be the kind of environment where it's like once you get over the hump of going all in, like like not one bit of the project lives outside of emails, lives outside of Notion, if, if there's a efficiency uh, in within that environment, uh, and 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 keep in mind, uh, there's a bit of reasoning for this because uh, uh, I'm I'm starting to decide that it's easier to change my brain than it is to figure out how to change the world to suit my brain, and so uh, like I'm buying in on the Adobe Creative Cloud license seat that I have, and so I'm editing videos on my phone with Adobe Rush that upload automatically to the cloud. Then I sit down at the desktop and I finish editing it in Premiere um, uh, seamlessly. And the only way that's going to happen is if I stop trying to do things the way I know to do them and instead begin from the beginning relearning everything yet again from scratch. And I'm wondering if you have the vibe that Notion has a similar payoff. Yeah, I mean, I spent... I spent a lot of time trying to think about what's the problem that I'm going to have is it was scaling. And the problem I was trying to like, one, I, you know, where do I go to find out how many users I have? Where do I go to handle a customer support ticket? If, if we do interviews with customers to ask them how they like a thing, where do those interviews live? Where do all these things go? And yeah, I can throw them into a Google drive and have them there and then maybe go link them back to a master document. But I said, it's still, it's a bit of a maze you have to follow. And then I, I got hung up on Notion as kind of like the personal second brain stuff when a lot of, and like, it sounds kind of a little bit not for me kind of thing. And a lot of people just, I kept hearing about the second brain space and I ignored what it did from an organizational level, but then thinking like, oh, my job with everything I do is to make sure the next person that has to do it can inherit it and do it really easily. 
And that's what I like a lot about this is because also I can write a document here on my own notion and then I can upload it to you know the other, the company, the corporate workspace. There's a lot of that. So I look at it like one is for me, like for me right now, I pop open my task list and there's my task list. On the middle of writing a note, I go, oh, I got to do a future thing. Well, I go put that in the future thing. When it comes to the corporate version, if I say, okay, you know, when I'm talking to Rush about, hey, where's the status on this? What's that? Well, I go into the shared workspace and there's the doc that's there. If we bring in, you know, employee number three and they're supposed to handle the code, well, where do they go? Well, you start with the Notion doc, you read the thing about the code repository, you go through what's happening there, and then you look who created it and you ask some questions and you can do message and stuff. So, um, but to your point, yeah, Brian, like I think that, Adobe, Adobe's earned my money. When Adobe was announcing subscription and I kept thinking of it like, ah, it's just a photo editor, you know, and then, and then I have a conversation with a friend. I'm like, I said, I'll, I'll do it if it continues to be justifiable and better. There are other things I don't pay for. Like a lot of people try to do subscription apps and I'm like, I want this app to be the same thing today that it is the day I bought it. I don't care about new features. And if you're telling me you want to charge me a fee to keep the thing running, fine. Yeah. Then make that fee not ridiculous you know side note i don't know if you heard about this new uh iphone app that does for 12 bucks a month that does new wallpapers and i cannot wait for marcus brownlee to go review this and tear it down because it is like the craziest idea what uh uh have you, have, you, have you heard about this this is big uh youtube drama Brian. no no so uh, uh are you familiar with uh, marcus oh, brownlee yeah, yeah, sure, the, uh, sure. uh, uh, uh yes he does technology reviews so he put out an app called Panels, I believe, but it is a subscription app that dynamically gives you iPhone wallpapers. Uh, and uh, he has been raked over the coals for such a frivolous product at such a exorbitant price. Uh, a, a old tweet of his went viral because of it, which was uh, never let anybody charge you for something that is already free. <laughs> Got it. Okay. And so... Yeah. And now there's a new thing that is doing the same thing that he was. No, his. it's his. I was oh, joking. It's his, his app. app. It's okay. his what, app. What, yeah. what would he say about his own thing? Because so it's the, the, it's fine. I mean, you, you do whatever you want, but when your reputation is, you know, being the straight, a, straight shooter, I'm not going to try to milk you. Uh, do, to do charge favor, as just much as a Netflix to subscription. Device. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A Netflix subscription for literally, you know, like, like I, don't, I, I think he could, I think there's a place for subs like, you know, he's known for his wallpapers and backdrops. I think, but people are like, wait, 12, 12 bucks a month, 12 bucks a month for this. And then somebody, I watched a designer tear down the ad. It's like, Marcus is known for design. Like, look at this inconsistency here. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I gotta be it's careful. You know, it's, it's careful out there. But, uh, anyhow, um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll see where the experiment goes. You know, I I don't feel like, oh, it's a big risk because I don't know what else I was going to do, you know, other than just have a bunch of little pieces here and there. Uh, the AI features was really great. That's proven very worthwhile. Um, I'm going to start plugging other things into it now and see how well that works. They now have Notion sites, which is not super cheap. But it's like 10 bucks a month. But I do think I'll use the Notion website builder because... I, they're very, they look very notiony, which is not thrilling. But when you say, okay, I need to build a customer support site, I need to go do this. Well, I can, I build sites, but to maintain it, I know building is easy. Maintaining is hard. You heard it yes. here first. Uh, folks. And you, you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. I, I was going to bring up that uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see notion develop because like, I wonder if there'll be knock on benefits down the road as AIs get better and better. Like if all of your website lives within this space and notion continues to be a, a well-regarded platform, then it seems like it's going to just keep on doing more and more of the stuff that normally you'd have to go to outside of notion to do. And uh, for example, once upon a time, Squarespace, uh, this is not an ad, even though they are a sponsor for modern rogue. Um, uh, once upon a time, they just did websites real easy, but then bit by bit, they added, oh, wait, you know what everybody who has a website wants is a online store option and then, you know, an email and a members only section and video blocks and, 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 and now like Squarespace is legitimately, you know, if, if you're on a street corner with a message, 
everything can scale to a nationwide platform that gets monetized or whatever, all within that ecosystem. And it'd be interesting to see if Notion is able to pull that from the, uh, 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 you know, from the logistics uh, of, of creating a new, a new business, a new factory. Yeah. Like they, I was never happy with Squarespace personally. Cause like it was always a, a, I thought the cost benefit, I think for certain businesses it made sense. And then like I, when I had to go do my, my, interdimensional website i looked at squarespace played on their templates i looked at what they were charging per month i said for what i'm using it for it was just absurd and so i went to wordpress and you know well, not that wordpress was much much cheaper but i'm like no i need to have a blog i need to have a presence i need to do this and i did that now with i look at for you know with channel three which is my wife's company i look at like what I need there. I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to need to have, you know, one, well, I'm going to have to have a terms and agreement, you know, of like a user agreements page. I'm going to need to have a sales and feedback thing. And I want to do that kind of easy. And I don't want to be copy pasting stuff. Like that was my problem with WordSpace with, with, with Squarespace was I'd be copying from Google Docs into there and back and forth and stuff. And I think that there is going to be an opportunity for Notion to be like, if you need this, this is fine. You're going to be great here. You'll scale here. You're going to be, you know, this is going to work for you. We need to go above there, then fine, but we'll get you to here. And for audio listeners, I'm holding my hands at like eye level, <laughs> indicating that it's a certain amount of utility. Uh, they bought a company that does email. So the rumor is they're probably going to add in their own email system to it, which I think might be kind of a bit of a game changer. Because right now, when you get your company email, you either go to Outlook or you go to Google Gmail. Workspace. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you set up as Google Workspace, but you know, if we ported that over to, if we if they integrate that well, like they have their own calendar now, if they integrate their own email service into there, where I can, because you know, Notion has messages. You can have a thing. You can have your team members comment, add messages to a doc, which is great. Then if we had an email system and there's just literally email, that's a pretty, pretty useful system there. Yeah. So. We'll see. You know, I think they spend a lot of time. The apps are pretty nice. Works well on the phone. There's tons of people who are obsessed with it, building stuff. So that's always helpful. It's like, are there a lot of maniacs out there supporting a thing to keep it running? Yeah, I, I use it for, you know, very simple stuff, non-database stuff. But uh, it's been my prep sheet, my go-to prep sheet for uh, over a year now. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's all I got. Cool. You got picks? I got a, I got a mm. utility. I got a very short pick. I was trying to think of something useful that I noticed this week, and uh, uh, you know, I'm getting back to working out and running and stuff. Uh, and I had a really good run yesterday, and I couldn't remember when I had started running. And uh, luckily, uh, the the whole Garmin ecosystem for the health fitness tracking on the Vivo Active Smart Watch. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's always had this stuff or it's just gotten better over time, but like, it, it seems to have figured out when I'm riding a bike, even if I don't tell it that I'm riding a bike based on, you know, accelerometer data and stuff. And, uh, I, I was able to figure out as a result of all that passive, uh, stuff, uh, and, and retroactively track when I started getting really healthy and it was, uh, it was really neat. So the, uh, the Gar Garmin Vivo Active smart watches and all that stuff, pretty good, pretty good. Cool. Uh, uh, th thank you very much to everybody rating us from Forge of, of Lore. You're here just in time to watch us wrapping up. <laughs> watch us wrap it up. But uh, 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 hey, my, my uh, productivity pick is for the first time over the last two weeks, I have not opened Audition to publish the politics 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 program i have done all of my editing within the web application of riverside uh and mm -hmm. then just pushed out a i think they have a thing to push out an audio version but i've just been pushing out a video version and then uh, exporting a, a audio version from it uh but you know, it just keeps getting more and more powerful. And and I've been able, they, they added, the one thing that made it possible was adding separate audio tracks. So now I could add all of my theme music and stuff like that. It's a little kludgy, but it works. And, and, you know, I had a thing yesterday where I did a bunch of debate prep and I had to uh, uh, cut up clips from a debate, but having it 
transcribed and having a very simple way that I could just pop out uh, uh, each block of text into a new edit and then make it a separate clip that I could drag into my, uh, my, my, my one timeline. It was really impressive. I never thought that I would edit within browser for a professional thing, but uh, uh, it's capable. And and uh, a big shout out. I mean, I mean, I, along that same line, I never thought that I would be recording content with the intention of publishing it on, you know, a, the premier YouTube channels uh, uh, with an iPhone, you know. But but we've hit the age of, yeah, it's good enough. It's pretty good. <laughs> so two things. Uh, one is I don't know if you know this, Justin, but at the end of the Riverside session. Um, after we finished and I went to go log out, it pops up a message to me, the guest, and says, hey, wouldn't it be great to try Riverside? And it had like this little scroller to see how the quality of video would be better on Riverside, whatever. It was exactly oh, really? the same. But I'm like, oh my God, this is a smart company because they realize yeah. every guest on there, somebody is a potential customer. Like that's there's some good thinking there. Um, Brian... Uh, you, you mentioned the iPhone, mm. um, and like, yeah, Rush is a really cool product. Like, like I said, Adobe, Adobe has like been very smart of understanding what people want, where they're going. Did you see? Did you watch the the keynote or the Apple announcement for the new iPhone? I did not. There is one of the very interesting capabilities. There is I don't know if you saw what they're doing with the audio. Uh, no, no, I just assumed, uh, what, what's funny is, uh, I know that the joke is every new iPhone is better camera, longer battery, better processor. And I've never cared about that uh, for the most part, except for until I started editing video on my phone with the intention of publishing short form content. And then the first time I hit the export button and then watched the render bar, I was like, oh, hells no, I'm going to buy the new phone immediately for the faster processor. So they have a new feature, which is called audio mix. And so basically on the phone, because they have all the microphones, you should check out the demo of it, but the, they're now paying as much attention to audio. Powered by advanced intelligence spatial audio capture, audio mix lets you adjust the way voices sound in your videos using three different voice options. Want to decrease background sound or just focus on the voices that are in frame? Simply select the mix and adjust the intensity to get the sound you want after the video capture. And they did the demo of this in the commercial, you know, the, the promo for it. And it was, I'm like, man, if I was a film student, this was really awesome because they show like just how good the audio capturing capability of it this was. Is oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah, play it. Go okay, for it. Go here for we it. go. This is somebody yeah. testing it out. This is being reported on the iPhone 16 Pro Max, and the sound you're hearing is coming directly from the iPhone. I'm actually using the audio mix feature in studio mode which makes it sound like I have a microphone connected to me, even though I have nothing connected to me. Like, look how far away you are. Let's zoom out there. Holy moly. Look how far away you are. Let's come back to 1X. So it sounds very, very clear. And you can actually hear there's a water, river e type of sound next to me. But when I turn the sound of studio on, it cuts that out completely. And you can hear just me. And if I turn that off, the sound comes back up again. So if you forget your microphone, definitely use this feature. I'm going to be using it all the time. Get out. I wish I hadn't just bought a good mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's I, still it's still going to be good. Yeah, to have. no. <laughs> yeah. I, I so, but I, I do think that you're in the the. I would say kudos to Apple because now this the, the fact that now that I can use my iPhone mic several feet away and it's that I don't need to have like the extra mics. Like, yeah, a really good uh, studio mic. So it's always going to be better. Always going to be better. Right. But the the state where this AI is that you could record. You know, they always had to create visual. That was always a problem. Like we've we've been able to do incredible movie quality visuals for a thousand bucks for about twenty years with digital video. Audio always sucked. Audio always sucked. And, and, and that, that was, was always, always the tell. Like you could tell, like somebody knew how to frame a shot, knew how to edit. Maybe the and the camera was good enough. The yeah, lighting is one of those other tells where it's like, but but if you're outside, you know, outside looks like outside or and so on. But 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 the real tell especially in the aughts, was just nobody could afford uh, microphones, cardioid mics uh, to wear on their bodies. Well, they're, they're too lazy to. That was the problem. It really was like it was just after the fact. And you, you'd go to film festivals and watch student films, and somebody played all their, all their time with their Canon camera and zero time on audio. And then you'd see this, oh, it's well shot. And you're like, oh, the famous is a film. And you're like, this... 
I know this is like I know this is like even low budget films, like you know Christian films. Like I know, I can, I can tell you what I'm listening to, not even the words, because nobody gave an f about audio. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now, kind of amazing. So agreed, gentlemen. It's been after. We did it. Uh, all right, boys. I gotta run and take care of this child of mine. The child. You mean bleep oh, the child. doodle do? It's a real, it's a real, 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 real grok tars taint, man. When you really <laughs> think about it. I'll talk to you. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you to everybody who, who rated us. Uh, uh, I, I think I'm going to wrap up the stream. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Uh, Monday for Cord Killers. Bye.